Well, welcome everyone. So glad you're with us. We're going to take a trip to Uganda today. That'll be fun. We have Leslie Robertson here to lead the program and she has many of her colleagues that are going to join us as they can um, via Zoom. The links are sometimes unpredictable, but we'll have a great program for you regardless. We have backup plans. Okay, um, so before we get started, I think I wanna share my screen with you and talk just a minute about We Have a Real Peace for any of you who are, whoa, what's up there? Okay, for any of you who are um, new to We Have a Real Peace, it's easy to get there. Just type in We Have a Real Peace. Of course, mine comes up really quickly when I type it into my browser because I go there a lot. So there's our smiling faces from an annual meeting when we were in Oaxaca. How many years ago was that, Kelsey? Do you remember? Oh, it, probably seven or eight years ago now, probably. Seven or eight years ago, yep. Um, but this year we're going to be meeting in the States. We're going to be near Cleveland at Kent State University. And there's a lot of interesting programs as well as field trips to take. So if you haven't been to a WARP annual meeting before, I highly recommend you consider coming this year. And of course, today, this is where we're going to be, Bark Cloth of Uganda. Um, we also have a fireside chat coming up in May with one of our members, Kalinda Attar. And there's all sorts of good stuff there. You can find out about the meeting in Kent, Ohio, and this is all on our website. Hey, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie to introduce herself, her organization, and uh, get the program started. Perfect. Um, if you'll allow me to share, and I found Peter and the gang, so I've got them pinned. Um, yay! Perfect. And so um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, we might have a little bit of audio feedback and some technical difficulties. So as a whole, we're going to work through this because we're actually connecting um, to a uh, rural area in Uganda. So I'm going to go ahead and do a share and get us started to give a little context of what we're um, what we're doing. So again, bear with us. We've been doing a lot of um, uh, juggling this morning. Um, so my name is Leslie Robertson. Um, I am a textile artist and designer. And for about the last 15 years, I have worked in Uganda um, with an incredible group and an incredible team of, in, of artists, designers, researchers, um, stakeholders, traditional knowledge workers, um, and most recently, in the last probably 10 years recently, um, have been working with uh, an incredible team in Western Uganda called Organic Tree Farmers Association. And so I wanted just to give a quick overview of who we are, um, what we're going to be talking about today, and hopefully keeping our fingers crossed that our partners in Uganda um, are going to be able to share live um, from Bukam and Simbi. So again, um, been working in Uganda for years, um, first in arts and education, and most recently um, launching a small bespoke brand called Makeka Design. So these are um, kind of who, who, are, who is sharing with you today, kind of our collaboration. Um, I, because we have an interesting internet situation, I did want to put in portraits of everyone that is going to be sharing today, plus plus. Um, hopefully, and I think there's some more guys too that we'll have to introduce. I see them on the screen now. Um, Paul Katamira is a ninth generation bark cloth maker, a master of his trade, and an award-winning uh, award bark cloth maker. Um, this is Fred Mutebi, who is trying to desperately connect today from Kampala. Um, he and his brother Stephen right here started the Bukamin Simbi Organic Tree Farmers Association as a way to preserve this amazing material called bark cloth that we're going to learn about today. Um, this is me, of course. Um, I have some great partners with Makeka Designs and Josephine Mukasa and Pamela Kagera over here. Um, and we have Paul's sons. Um, I have one of them here. This is Peter Katamira, um, but his sons Vincent. Uh, Loisius um, and Tony 
plus several of their other family members are taking up and becoming 10th generation bark cloth makers, um, carrying on this really amazing tradition. Now I've been saying the Botfa and Bukum and Simbi a lot. I'm just gonna put up on screen um, so that you can see a little bit of what they do. Uh, they are founded again by brothers Fred and Stephen Kamya, and it's a center that partners with bark cloth makers, not any makers, master bark cloth makers that have had this in their family for generations and generations. And so I, um, at Makeka Designs, I partner with Botfa. Um, I create a lot of textiles with in collaboration with everyone. Um, and I use all of my bark cloth comes from the Botfa Center here in Uganda. So that gives you a little context of our partnership together and our collaboration over the last several years. I wanted just to start with what on earth is bark cloth? Um, we're gonna have a chance to hear a little bit more about it live, I'm hoping in a minute, uh, but bark cloth in Luganda is called Lubogo. It's a 700 year old tradition in Uganda where bark is stripped from the matuba tree called Ficus natalensis. It's pounded into very beautiful supple cloth. And again, they have some great um, pieces there they're gonna show us. What's really cool is the tree isn't harmed, but it grows bark back once a year, up to 50, 60, 70, 80 years, maybe a hundred years if we're really good at that. So that you're not just hearing from me, I'm gonna try to turn it over to Stephen right now in Uganda. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen, Kelsey, and if we can pin them, I would love Stephen for you to introduce everyone with you and then for you to um, share a little bit about the tree and what makes it so unique. For this wonderful meeting, and um, right now I'm with a team of processors. I'm with Paul, um, Peter, uh, I'm with Ruella, and Bill. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to interrupt just really quickly. Um, what I'll do is I love seeing your video. Let me just repeat back what you said because I know pretty much everybody there. Um, Stephen was introducing the bark cloth makers, um, our team that we work with, and the team that he works with there. Um, I two of two people are new to me, but um, Peter, can you show Peter? Um, Peter Samla uh, is right next to him. He was right here. Hi, Peter. Uh, Aloysius Luimba is right behind him, and Aloysius was at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival with us last year. It's so good to see everybody. Um, and then. Let's see. Um, I think is Dennis back there as well. I can't tell. We've got two other. We'll put it in the chat. Everybody's name in a little bit, but it's really good to see you guys live. Um, what I'm going to do, Stephen, is um, because the audio is so poor, I'm going to go ahead and play the video that you sent this morning. So y'all stay on. But I'm going to share, I'm going to have Kelsey share her screen and we're going to play the video about the tree that you sent this morning. Yes, uh, my name is Stephen Kamia. Today we are with a team of processors. I mean, backlog processors. And uh, they are trying to harvest a tree. This tree is called Mutuba tree. It's Ficus naturalis tree. We are promoting the growing of this tree because of its marked advantages. First, the tree can be harvested for more than a hundred years. When you harvest its bark, it recovers it after one year. So every year you can harvest its bark after the bark material is processed into bark cloth material which is highly demanded by artisans in different parts of the world. In addition to that, 
As you can see, the tree supports the growing of other crops. You can see these passion fruits. They are grown in an organic way. We don't spray. So by this, we are trying to address food security issues. Um, when its leaves fall off, they decompose to form manure. Um, when you cut off part of the branches, it recovers its branches a little bit faster compared to other tree species and um, the leaves are eaten by goats as fodder. Um, in addition to that, this waste material, these are also used as fodder for goats. Uh, but they are also used as fertilizers because when we boil the bark material, there is that water that remains. We manage it and um, we apply it as liquid manure. So we encourage farmers in different parts. We encourage farmers in different parts of the country where this type of tree can be grown to think about growing it because of its smart advantages. We believe also it will have far-reaching impact onto nurturing weather and climate conditions because a collection of its canopy, a combination, has a great potential to replace the worn out forests. So we encourage farmers, please, let's plant this kind of tree because of its smart advantages. Perfect, thank you so much, Kelsey. And th Stephen, thank you for sending the video ahead of time. It helps so much. Um, we will be able uh, to kind of sum up what Stephen was saying. Let me share my screen again. The tree is a really fascinating tree. It has this ability to shed its bark once a year and still live. But the other thing that's interesting is that the tree, I'm gonna show you a great slide right here. The tree itself supports a polyculture around it. And what Stephen was saying is that so many parts of the tree are used from fodder, so feed for animals and goats, all the way to um, the liquid being poured on crops as a replacement for manure is for its, its um, nutrients in it. And then whenever you see a matuba tree, it usually doesn't exist on its own. It's within all these other food crops. Um, what Stephen and the center are doing and, and Fred and the team is they're tying in bark cloth production with food security in the region. They do a lot of workshops and teaching classes on it. It's a fascinating material. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead. Um, I Again, I don't know if we're gonna be able, um, Stephen, if we'll be able to move to that area with the Bukaman, with the Ekomagiro, which is the um, bark cloth making area. Let me see if I can, I think it's still gonna be a little choppy. Um, but I do see Fred, my good friend Fred Mutebi here. Fred, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Wonderful. So Fred, if you can, um, I'm going to play some videos that Stephen sent us this morning. Um, and then Fred, why don't you just do a quick hi and hello? Um, and then hello. Have, yeah. Welcome, everybody. And where are you calling in from? Fred, this is the best connection we've ever had. I'm so excited. Yeah, I, yeah I just arrived in my studio. So I'm uh, right now based in my studio. I've been hearing you right from the beginning. Thank God. It's so exciting. Well, Fred, I'm going to play some videos of the bark cloth making. So feel free to narrate on top of that. Um, okay. And then we'll share and, you know, we'll share a little bit later on from your studio. Uh, so let me get here. So this is a video. Um, let's see. Uh, I love being on WhatsApp with the team. Peter is uh, and Stephen are both amazing at sending videos. So every morning, every few mornings, I wake up and there's a new video of them processing a tree, or you know, there's another tree adopted out. And so this is a short video made from um, what he sent me last week of the how do you take the bark from the tree and make it into cloth. 
So, Fred, if there's anything you want to say on top of that, go ahead and feel free. Yeah, I need to say something about tree adoption. Oh, Fred, we're going to do that later on in the presentation. Okay. What particularly did you want me to talk about? Oh, just Sorry anything about... about the process. And I don't know if we can with this music on top of it. Yeah, I think I've heard what Stephen presented and what you have covered pretty much all about the process, about it's being renewable, that it, uh, when you harvest, it, it reduces and it will be harvested every year for over 100 years. So which tree do we need to promote more than that? And Fred, don't Leslie, this, each of the stages have a different name? There are three different stages of their beating the bark cloth. I can't yes. honestly remember them. Yes, they, each one of them, actually each stage, right from when you take it off of the tree, has a name, traditional. The only good thing or bad is that it's all 100% local vocabulary. It's in Uganda. So only the makers know about it. So we want to standardize this, the, the, this process so that the rest of the world can know understand, or understand the process in other languages. And we are going to start with English. Um, so each stage has a name. And uh, the vocabulary develops as it, the process goes on all the way to the end, from Kusaka to Ganjula to Kul So it's all in Uganda, but we are now in the process of standardizing. We want also to have uh, the vocabulary translated to English because we are also trying to educate people who don't understand Uganda. So we need to, 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 to develop a, voc a vocabulary uh, a syllabus and a curriculum. So I think within a few years, we'll have a language that every, everybody will understand. And we start with English. Thank you, Fred. Um, and it's, it's amazing. So much um, intricate knowledge goes into making bark cloth. Um, Fred, I don't know if you can see the video as well, but this is this morning from the center, the Botfa Center. And this video shows the boiling like you're talking about. And once it's boiled, Stephen, is that the the liquid from the boiling? Is that what you're using for um, the different uh, fertilizers? Yes, please, Leslie. Uh, that's the liquid which we use as fertilizer. We pull it down and we apply pepper. It's also a plant material, pepper material, and uh, a percentage of tobacco, and then ash. But then we apply okay, and you can see some of the guys this morning um, creating some of the cloth. And then Kelsey, what I might have you do is um, this is another video um, that Stephen is narrating. So if I'll stop sharing, if you will kind of put, pull yours up. Thank you all for your patience as we're flipping back and forth. I, for uh, Fred and Stephen and all of us, it's it's important that it's not my voice that you hear, but as much as possible, everybody else's. So it takes a little bit of wiggling around. Okay. And this yes. was filmed this morning in Uganda. Yes. Um, right now we are at the center, uh, and these are part of the product. These are part of the sheets the processors are making. We have got different fashions. We have got brown, we have got white, we have got dark brown, different and in different sizes. As you can list some of them. Um, these are part of the sheets. You are Makanini from that corner. Yes, we have different fashions. We have this. Um, light brown. Mr. Dino, can you see that one? White. Yeah, we also have white. Light. Um, in different, different colors, different textures. Uh, can you also lift black? Uh, we have black. Yeah, can you lift dark brown? Yeah, different.
different fa yeah these are part of the back cloth material we will showcase the products from back cloth yeah right from the tree back to this material and then some other products Stephen, can you answer, um, someone was asking why the different colors and where the color comes from. And then Stephen, uh, yeah, let's see if we can hear you. Yes, please. Uh, in response to that question, it depends. It depends. Uh, sometimes it's white. It depends on what participants want to use at times. Um, there is a technique, if you want black, they dye it under clay to turn it black. And uh, if you really want light brown, then you do play the sheet under direct sunlight for a few minutes. If you really want dark brown, you take more time displaying it under direct sunlight, you take, get more dark brown chicks. Perfect. Yeah, that's what I can say about different colors. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen, there's a pretty decent video over here that Aloysius has. Um, let me go ahead and see if we can pin it. Um, and Aloysius, can you, if, if there, if the cloth is over there, um, it'd be really great to kind of see it live. Uh, right now we are in uh, a plantation with the trees and the banana plants. But uh, okay. we are planning to walk to the center where we put the buckles. So <laughs> with the processing unit to the center. So we take a walk. Okay. So. Stephen, what I'll do is, um, let me just repeat what Stephen said since it had a little bit of static to it. So the different color cloth is caused by how long it's left out in the sun. Um, additionally, how long uh, the type of tree. Um, Fred, am I missing anything? And then the black is clay dyed. So Fred- You're you right. Uh, the light- the light brown is actually not white. And there is a particular tree that it comes from. It's called Engeruka. Uh, Fred, I'd like to ask you a question. Can, yes, you please. Tell, can you tell us the different steps of the processing from the time the bark is removed from the tree until it actually has the texture of cloth and what causes that soft texture from a very hard, almost brittle material to begin with? Actually, like I said, the entire vocabulary is in Uganda. So I'm going to labor to, 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 to say it in Uganda, but also try to describe it. Yes, that would be fine. Right from when you take it off of the tree, it's called kuyimbula. And you use particular tools so that you don't damage the tree. And the tools they use is a panga. In traditional days, it used to be a particular shape which they don't make anymore. But now they have hangers, they have knives. So you mark it with a knife, you, you start peeling off the, the outer layer of the, of, the, of the back before you go into the second layer, which is called the back part. And uh, that's called ku, kuyimbula. You also use the inside of the tree. I don't know, you are, I'm going to ask you to pronounce it. It's called omunukwa nukwa. Can you say that? <laughs> I got it. Omanukwa nukwa. Omanukwa nukwa. That's nukwa. now the inside of the banana, which they shape in a, uh, in a way that is going to look like a knife, work like a knife, but it's not going to destroy the tree. I wish we had taken a video, but now that we have started that dialogue, we'll be showing all those things. So you take the back off. I, Ari Aruna, I saw the pictures, the videos of where it's take, being taken off of the tree. You move it into the water and you boil it up to boiling point, which takes about 15 minutes. You take it out and the purpose of boiling it is to suppress the sap because when you take it off of the tree, it has so much sap that when you take it direct to the, the pounding bar, you're going to be filled with sap. So they devised the means of suppressing it and they boiled it and they boiled it so that the sap is very limited and less so that it doesn't 
become difficult for them to beat it up. And the stage they use with the first mallet, the first stage is called kusaka. Kusaka is now because the back of the material, let me look around in the studio to see if I have a sample here. I used to have Kelsey, samples. Can you pin either Fred's video oh or the God. Stephen Kamya project video? Because both of them are live and kind of have great things. Yeah, going. but what I'm saying is that when you take the back of the tree, the fibers are lined in such a way that they are laid linearly. So the beating, the starting of the beating now transforms them into that self yarning. So the process starts being yarned when you use the first mallet and it's, it's called the Kusaka. And they use a special mallet. I wish uh, uh, we need to have a video of it, but it has sharp and wide grooves. So they, from Kusaka, they go to another stage called Ku, uh, are we, can we chip in? I want to introduce in the local people. And then we can. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's Leslie, do that. Because I think we have a you pretty decent. I... Go ahead, Fred. Do you want Kelsey it to makes pin? Sense if we hear from them and we can interpret. Yeah, let's see if we can hear from them. Can you tell us in Uganda right from? You can process so, Fred, I think the, the connection is just so unstable there. Um, but, yeah, have internet issues. Yeah, we do have but, internet uh, issues. But let's do this, um, Fred, because we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to go ahead to... Uh, um, you did. We can kind of... I want to leave some room for question and answer, but I would love for you to be able yeah, to no. as well. So let me, let me do this. Um, Peter and Stephen... It looks, and Aloysius, it looks like our internet is too unstable to hear you all. Um, but I will say it's so beautiful to see all of the different bark cloth and the colors. I have my eye on a couple pieces I need for Makeka already. I saw about two that I want. Um, so let me do this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, Peter, if you can just stay, I mean, excuse me, Stephen and, and the gang, if y'all can just stay on and we'll just kind of keep going. Um, I'm gonna try to have an opportunity for Fred to share about his work as well. So let me go back to our kind of- uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, we're, again, I'm so glad that it is good as it is right now, which makes me very happy um, that we can at least see you moving and hear you all. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over a couple things so that we have plenty of time left. Um, this is a real quick image, um, as Fred and, and everyone was saying, of it being dyed in clay for the black. It's great, great. It's beautiful, and it's a rich color. Um, and again, we just saw laying out some of the gorgeous, gorgeous colors, and it's all natural. Um, and this is a family business. I love this shot from Jamie House, who went with us, of um, the Peter, excuse me, Paul, and all four of his sons. And as, as just as, um, I'll show you just yep. a fun little quick video. And you can see the size of this cloth that comes from a tree and how wide it can get. Leslie, a couple of questions have come in uh -huh. um, that maybe you can answer. Yeah. Someone wanted to know if they harvest the entire bark or just a part of it. Um, Fred, jump in as well um, if you want to. They harvest up to a certain point underneath the, the branches, um, the first part of the branches. Right, Fred? Yes, I can keep in maybe. Yes, please. That depends on the size yes. of the tree. Do you hear me? Yep. When the tree is small, I think uh, the diameter of, let's say, up to um, three feet, that's the original bark, they can have a seat as a whole. But there are times when it's, the tree is too big and they need to do it in pieces. Like we have a piece that when you start with it, it's about six feet. So now they have to cut it in two and they have a stitch in different, I mean, 
at the same time, but in different parts. So basically it depends on the size of the tree, but very rarely do we have a situation where you have to divide it. We don't have many large trees. So it's harvested all at once. Very good. Uh, let me also ask if the hammering process with that mallet, the special mallet, um, does that increase the sheet yes. dimensions and make it thinner? Yes, uh, from thick to thin, it moves now in the direction where the fibers, I think in, in um, width length, it moves in the width side. So the, but it's the mallet that actually spreads it from thick to thin. And they use different mallets. The Kosaka is when, uh, actually I have examples. Oh, do you uh, have them there? I've got the a picture video? up. Can I? Right, I've got a picture up of Paul with a with a have... ten of his mallets um, that they can see Look, as well. Was like, Let me see. I think Peter tried to explain it, but the audio wasn't good. So okay. I think Paul has all the mallets there. Oh, sorry. Let me share and, my screen uh, again. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me put it back on full screen. Yes. Yeah, he has all the mallets here. And, and interestingly, Fred, remember yeah, one of them, I don't know which one, it was his grandfather's mallet, so it's over. Exactly, it's difficult to pinpoint which one is which. I think it's the but one basically they apply this. By his foot. And then this one, I, he's, I don't know if you can see my arrow, I wish you could. Um, but the smallest one, I think he said in the video we had was his childhood mallet. Um, and then his grandfather, I think it's the one by his foot mm. right here. Um, that was the one passed down from his grandfather, who's pictured here at the bottom right. Yes, and and are, so are the bark, her is the bark cloth? Excuse me, yeah. is the bark cloth used for uh, canvas for paintings? Is it made into garments? Is it, it what is it used for? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Fred, I'll let you take it over. I've got a bit, I've got a shot Can of you, you up. I don't, do you see where I'm seated? Okay. Uh, Where's my video? Do you see right. this? It's work in progress. And I'm telling the world, back cloth will have the best canvas ever, especially when oil is done, because most of the canvases that artists paint on are synthetic material made out of oil. So take it from me as an artist researcher that we are going to have the best canvas coming from uh, uh, back cloth. So this is now, we talked about the process. If you look at this, I don't know whether you can see it properly. See, mm -hmm. that's a painting uh, that I painted on the first stage, the one of Kosaka. And it looks like I'm painting on leather. You can see the marks of the mallet. The yeah, marks Fred, of the mallet. Hold the camera still you real quick. Just, Fred, uh, hold this camera still. And don't move it. And then it'll zoom in. There you go. You can see the mallet marks. So fun. Beautiful. Do you see? Yes. And then you compare with this now with a different texture. And that's another stage, which is Kufunira. So between the Kusaka and the Kufunira, you have the best canvases. And here is one in the process still work in the process. And let me zoom in to see the, the, the mallets. So it's all work in progress, but also we make paper. You see, I'm a printmaker and I am known for doing printmaking. And I've been painting, I mean, printing on uh, masa paper made in Japan, but I'm also now experimenting with paper made out of bar cloth. And if you compare, I think the future is brilliant for printmakers in the world to start using back cloth, make, back cloth paper. And this is the first research. So let research continue, let dialogue continue, and you will get the best as a team. Perfect. Thank you, Fred. Um, Fred, I'm going to share the screen again so if you can are able to see it. Um, just to kind of sum up, and I know we had some other questions. Fred is an artist, uses bark cloth um, 
for his studio practice. Um, but also designers are using it, artists are using it, um, people in Uganda are using it for special occasions to make garments out of. So it's a very versatile material that also has a lot of cultural history and significance to it as well. Um, we decided not to go down every rabbit hole of bark cloth for this presentation or it would be about three hours long. Um, but we did, Fred, I did want to have you go ahead and share um, what we're really excited about uh, the team with Peter and um, Stephen and everyone is a tree adoption and how we're really excited about being able to locate trees and take a census of them. So Fred, are you able to see the screen? Yes, I can see. So I didn't know if you would love to share kind of your vision for what we're doing now. Um, and then we'll still have a few, just in a few minutes, Fred, so we can have some- plenty Yes, of yes. You know, we have challenges. For us, we are sure that the future is brilliant in the value chain of backcloth making. But in order to optimally benefit from me as mankind, this is a mankind innovation. But many, I mean, don't know about that. Right now, even in Uganda, it's not planted all over the country. It's still confined in one area of Uganda. It's in Masaka. And even in Masaka, it's in the Bukomansimbi district. Even in the Bukomansimbi, it's in the Chibinge district. So our mission or goal is to make it, to have it have a national character. So right now, we started this tree adoption in order, first of all, in the process of standardization, we need to know how many trees we have. We need to know where are they, who has the trees in terms of a farmer and who is going to harvest it. In a way, we need to empower that section, the farmer and the processor. And once we sort out that, now satisfy that level in a way of building sustainability. So basically we are also doing a tree census. We are documenting the process so that we know, first of all, how many trees we have, in the district where we are operating and how many we can potentially plant. And I believe right now we have about, in the one sub-county, about 500,000. And in five, I mean, if we cover the, the five counties, for example, we may end up with at least 3 million trees as we proceed. And as you realize, uh, once we get to that level, and we have enough trees, we have enough processors because this tree without being managed properly, it will die. Or if it doesn't die, it will stay and serve the other purposes of providing manure and acting as a, sh a shady tree for coffee, which most people are doing now because we have few processors. So we want tree adoption to, to help us to also take care of the extra planting of trees and training the processors and empower the farmers so that we can satisfy that level. And then once that is done, our standardization journey will have started. So basically that's how what tree adoption is all about. Empowering the first circle, empowering the grassroots community where the story begins. Perfect, thank you so much, Fred. Um, so I'll just kind of tell you what I'm showing you on the screen right now. Um, it, We've teamed up together right before Christmas to create an adoption program and geolocating your tree. Um, Peter, I'm gonna give a very big shout out to Peter and Steven for their help um, and working with Google Maps to literally pinpoint our trees. Um, so everyone has a location. Um, to kind of do a fundraiser for them, we decided to adopt out trees. Um, we had, I were able to adopt out about 20 of them in December um, everybody was able to have a tree that was located from the, like Fred said, farmer, the subspecies, which is super important because there's a lot of research right now with our partners on the medicinal value. We need to be able to identify where are all these subspecies of trees at, where are they located, um, who is the processor, what village, and then we do have adopted list, right? Um, it was really cool because we were able to send not only a video, um, but a photo of your tree um, and a geolocation coordinate. So you could actually get on Google Maps and find it. 
Um, as a as a bespoke studio, I've adopted, I don't know how many, I think 15 so far. And so I'm able, like Fred said, we're working on standardization and we're working on traceability so that as artists and designers and Jose Hindo, who's another wonderful artist, adopted 20 trees for her practice. Um, I'm in the middle of working with uh, Medili Collective out of uh, North Carolina to adopt trees for what she's going to be using for her products. So it's a really fascinating way of supporting um, what Fred and the team need on the ground to preserve this amazing skill. Um, but also it gives this um, wonderful story of traceability down to the single tree, right? And eventually, and hopefully a couple of years, you'll be able to have one of our pieces. This is a fun little laptop case I make. I don't know if you can see me here, um, but I'll be able to say, oh, this is the geolocation coordinates of this tree that this came from. Um, again, we're a very uh, small grassroots team, like Fred said, um, but we're really excited for what we're doing. What you see on the screen here, um, Peter sends me these really amazing, I call them like tree playing cards, um, where he has the farmer, the tree, who adopted it, where it's at. Um, so it's really exciting for what we're doing. Um, and then Fred, I didn't, I was going to go ahead and just share if you would love to support what we're doing. I'll, I'm going to put in the chat um, how you do that. Um, Stephen uh, and the team on the ground are the ones that literally go out into the village, locate the farmer, the tree. Um, I, we assign the tree a number, uh, find someone to adopt it, and then um, they're working on planting trees in addition to not only documenting them. Um, it's a really wonderful circular system that we're working on. Um, Fred or Stephen, I want to kind of wrap up so we have 10 minutes for questions. I'm going to skip over one other thing. Um, Fred or Steven, is there anything y'all want to add right now before we open it up for question and answers? And then I'll put these links in the chat while we're doing Q&A. I think I'll wait for questions. Okay, perfect. Steven, are you able to still hear us as well? If And if you're able to, you can always answer questions, Steven, by sending me a WhatsApp message. <laughs> okay, since the audio is a little tricky. Um, so Judy, will you help manage the Q&A part right now? Yes, I'd love to. I um, have a question about where the trees are located. Are they near Kampala or throughout the country? Right, I'll let you be the main answer of questions. Yeah, I I, I, I partly, uh, I didn't hear the whole question, but is it, it's in relation to the location of the trees around Kampala or up? Kampala is this is a city. Yeah. So the trees are not in Kampala. They are way back in the village in Bukoman Simbi. That's where Stephen is best. But uh, in terms of uh, location, you can find these trees elsewhere in Uganda as just trees. They are not even harvested. They are just using the branches to feed the goats. In the other areas, they are using it as firewood. In the other areas, they are using it for other things. So. It's a tree that can grow everywhere in Uganda, but also in most parts of the world. So the location is now where we have it is basically about um, three hours from Kampala. And where the project is, is in Bukoma CB. But uh, I think the rest of the country, the whole of Uganda has these trees in one way or another. Scattered. Very good. And that's why we want to distribute it in a manner that is planted in uh, a pattern and a design that will ensure that we benefit from it optimally. Now, I remember at the beginning, uh, someone said these trees were ficus tree. Is that right? Ficus? No, come again. The uh, genus of the tree. What is the name of the tree? What, what is the plant? The name, name in the local or... In a local language, it's called the Mutuba. And they have, we have 13 different species. The scientific name is Ficus nantalesis. But in Uganda, it's called the Mutuba. In Runyankole, it's called the Mito Chitoma. In Rusoga, it's called the Mugaire. In uh, Northern Uganda, I think all the way to Kotido, that's where um, there's a big. Uh, uh, forest is it's called Ituba, so it has different names depending on where uh, the tree is located. Okay. Because Uganda is a multicultural country, so basically, right now, because it's practiced in Uganda, 
most of the uh, most of the, the vocabulary is in Uganda, so it's called Mutuba in Uganda. But in English, and the scientific name is Thikas in Atarasi. Very but good. maybe at this note, let me also talk about the value chain because in order to have that growth, you also need other things, the trees, mallet making trees. The mallet making trees actually are not, don't necessarily grow in the Buganda. They grow in other parts of Uganda, Bunyoro, Ankole, uh, and they are in the forests. Unfortunately, we have a problem of deforestation. Most of these trees are being destroyed by Ugandans. And that's why worry, that's what worries us. And that's why we keep making a lot of noise so that when they talk about the preservation and protection of back growth, they should also take care of the preservation of the other trees. So it's a value chain. In order to have back growth, you have to have the other trees. Maybe. I you understand? Okay. Yes. Understand. Any other Thank question? Uh, uh, let's see. Are cl is clothing made from bark cloth? And if so, what type? Clothing. Mm -hmm. When it had just been invented, actually, the Baganda are the people who didn't walk naked in the history of mankind. Back then, it was clothed by almost everybody in the region. But as the other, I want to answer about clothing, which we don't do anymore. We don't wear back cloth right now because they brought better clothes according to them, because we believe in terms of resiliency, it, you cannot wear it and wash it every day. So it's in, in the contemporary uh, setting, it's not a cloth that we are wearing because cotton came in. But in the past, before the introduction of cotton and other uh, um, materials from which they made cloth, it was being worn. And uh, I still don't know, people keep asking us about how it's washed, but they used to wear it and washed it and they were using traditional methods. And that's part of the research that we are doing because they used local herbs, they used local, um, pumpkins local and it was all in the thickets in uh, in uh, in uh, um, wetlands and uh, and the swamps which most of them are being destroyed now that's why at the center we have a section of a wetland and um, a, a swamp where we are trying to propagate all those uh, uh, old uh, uh, species so that we can combine it to the value chain of making back growth research as we develop it also for the other people. So wearing it is not now, but I'm also not worried about that because if we can't wear it, let's do it, use it for other things as a material. Leslie is using it for so many things. I'm using it for canvas. The other person is using it for, for bags, etc. And uh, Jose Hendo is also using it for fashion. So I don't know, maybe I wish Jose Hendo would be here to, for those, I can't speak for those who are using it for fashion. Why are they using it for fashion, for wearing? They need to tell us the kind of design they make. How are they supposed to be worn? When and where? So that's not my area. And I don't want to talk more about what I'm not eloquent about. I know about canvas, that even if we harvested all of them for canvas, I would be happy that we take them for canvas. Because the value chain, before it comes to canvas, it will have given us the water, Stephen mentioned the fertilizer, but there's a huge potential for medicine out of it. Yeah. I wish Kastin is part of this, that he can, she can tell us about the medicine. Well, let because me, her, that's her section. Yeah, let me just jump in, Fred, real quick. I'll put, um, I'll put a link to the abstract, but Kirsten has worked with the Manchester um, University. Um, and unfortunately, she's in a, on a train right now. She's based in UK, she couldn't join. Um, but again, she's part of our bark cloth research network team. Um, she's working with um, microbiologists and chemists on medicinal properties. They found that when it's applied topically, it'll kill 99% of MRSA and staph infections. So it's a very understudied material. Um, so again, you know, just like Fred said, there's so many different ways um, that this material is used. I wanted just because I'm watching Stephen's video, Stephen, I wanted to see if there's, it's the sun's starting to go down for you all. 
Um, if you wanted to say any last minute hello, you know, thank yous or anything, Stephen, before um, we're able, we're, we have to get off in a few minutes. So can you hear us, Stephen, and maybe take off mute just to, to, to so we can say goodbye to you um, in case uh, we have to jump soon? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's. I think he said he's going to send everyone some bark <laughs> I believe together we can change the world. It's get here and some of the team members come from. Well, we're doing the best we can on this audio. Yeah. But Stephen One last question cool. for you, Leslie. One yeah. last question for you yes. before we sign off. If someone wants to adopt a tree, how much does it cost? So we we're asking thirty five dollars, okay. um, five of it because so I take so it. Much. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, it's thirty five dollars, five of it. Just to be transparent, I keep to pay taxes on it because we're not a nonprofit, so it comes to Makeka Designs. Um, I send the rest of the money, thirty dollars, straight to Botfa. Um, the people that go out to document the trees get paid a specific amount for their time, and then the rest goes into a fund for whatever they need it for. Um, and so I think Peter last time bought. What do you buy, Fred? Like 15 mallets with it, and which is super important. So it's we're very transparent. If anybody ever wants to adopt a tree and know where the money goes, we'll tell you exactly. Um, and I did see another question. We Actually, constantly Leslie, try to find about, grants. So we would love any let me grants try to that clarify you know about of adoption. Oh, okay, go ahead, Fred. There, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Fred. Sorry. Oh, now you're muted. Now you're muted. Hold on. Hold on. Unmute. Yeah, the tree adoption is about taking care of the farmer and the processor. So it can be, depending on the size of the tree, it can be either below 35 or more, depending on the size of the tree, and depending on the, who the adoptee is. Most of the people that have already adopted are also taking the material, mm -hmm. but there are those who are going to adopt and they, don't, they are not interested in the material. So maybe 35 will work for those who are going to adopt and mm -hmm. not necessarily take the material. But we also, that's where ACA comes in, that that material is going to be collected and sold now at ACA Gallery via Josephine and Pamela. Mm -hmm. And then the proceeds of that will go now to helping us in training more processors because we need them. We have now so few. And like I've told you, people have embraced it. I need to mention right now that we have trees ready for harvest in another kingdom, Toro. Joe and Kant, who harvested in, uh, I mean, who invested in this project, now has almost about 150 trees ready for harvest. So we need to spread. So we need the funds to buy more mallets, to have more youth trained. So the proceeds will be channeled into that, that uh, where the adoptee does not take the material. But on the other hand, if the adoptee is interested in the material, he also gets it cheaper because they will have eliminated the middleman. The middleman yeah. is the one responsible for killing this value chain of backcloth preservation and protection. Well, thank you, Fred. And just to sum up what Fred was saying, so people like me, designers that, that work, we, we adopt a bunch of trees and then we because we want the actual material. Um, if anyone doesn't need the material and wants to support the program, this is a way of doing it to where you actually get a tree assigned to you that you can geolocate. So we're just trying to find ways, honestly, to support what BOTFA is doing um, in creative ways, because again, right, we've been writing for grants and sometimes we get them, a lot of times we don't. So um, we're very appreciative to all of you. I know we're kind of over time now. Um, is there, Judy, how I do think we we're going to have to go, Leslie, but go. thank you so much for... <laughs> For okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, everybody. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, Fred. We enjoyed your presentation very much. Keep thank going. you all. Welcome. And thank you, Warp. Y'all are very, very wonderful for hosting us. We appreciate it.